Hello and welcome to the studio. I'm just preparing a little dinner for an old friend. I'm expecting a little later. Meanwhile, you're invited to join us for a nice ride in the country. I know what you're thinking. Sounds like it could be chilly, but not to worry. It's more like we imagine this and show you how we painted it start to finish and how we had to ponder a few difficult decisions along the way. So bundle up and bring a mug of your favorite hot beverage. It's all next on The Complete Painter. Ah, you caught me. <laughs> now back to business. Uh, recently I had a couple lectures on the subject of painting snow. And that's actually how this painting got started. It was there. So let's take a look. Alright, so the colors that we're using for this, kind of the mother color we call that, is the overall temperature of this scene. We're using Prussian blue and it is extremely strong though so you got to watch it and you want to dull it down normally otherwise it looks like a cartoon when you're done i mean this is a very strong color in it you can see right there but i put a ton of cadmium red in that and it's still that strong you know um and i use cadmium red that's getting into the compliments thing that's really how you're going to make snow uh formulas is snow is all uh, some type of off-white, either darker colors. It's kind of this case more of a mauvey purplish thing. And it, that's in the areas where the sky can only shine on the snow. But it's not, you know, don't think of shadows as something in, in black or in darkness or a lack of light. Uh, I really don't paint shadows. That's what I keep telling people. I don't paint shadows. I just paint different areas of a painting that are lit by a different light source. Once in a while, a scene has to be only if you're in maybe outside and there's a little spotlight shining on there and you got clouds or something where there's you know blackout. You almost have to be in a forest where there's no light coming from the sky or anywhere for a shadow to truly be black. But even overcast sky at night, you walk around, you can see. It's not like you're walking and you're going to run into something. That's black. So you rarely ever have a shadow that's truly black. And indoors, you see the old master's paintings, which are very dramatic. I mean, that's a certain look where it looks like a spotlight on someone. The background's just black. It looks cool and is a nice way to paint something. But at the same time, it's actually not realistic at all because you can't have a light especially a bright one, shining in a room without it bouncing all around everywhere. You'd see the walls, you'd see everything in that room very lit up, and you don't in those paintings. But they're doing that, it has kind of more of a stage effect by doing that. So that's what I'm thinking when I paint this. I, I looked at areas where the sun cannot shine, but it still has value of where the light uh, shines stronger and weaker. The light in this case here or even here, it's coming from above. That's the direction of the light. So any surface of that snow that starts curving away, like in the groove, it simply gets darker. It's that same temperature, the same formula, the same mixture, but a darker version. So the simplest way to paint a shadow is by using the proper complementary color. And it, that way, it doesn't turn into some third color. Some, or some people put black in there. Uh, in nature, they came up with that theory, and it really is kind of based more on science, uh, complementary cars, because you really do see that. When a, a tree that's green and it gets in darker light, 
putting red in that green, it really does look like that, you know, when it gets darker for natural colors versus just putting black in everything. Um, so yeah, we use kind of complements. Basically, uh, a violet-based blue, where this is more of a green blue. You really see it's a different temperature. They're both blue, but very different. So like cobalt blue uh, has more violet in it, or ultramarine, but I'm pretty sure I use cobalt blue for this. Now up here, we threw cerulean blue in there as well a little bit. But by putting yellow, kind of an orangey yellow, in the blue, you kind of get a mauve, and we put a little red as well. So it's kind of a violety blue, so an orangey yellow would balance it out and dull that down and make a shadow color. Well, that's, if you don't have one of these and you're new to painting, get one. <laughs> now, the only thing you really need, the rest of this is a waste of time. If you're not, your colors don't even look like any of these. In fact, even on the front. What you're wanting to see is just the, this the theory, okay? That if you want to dull down blue and kind of make a black out of it, what color will do that without changing it into green or violet or some third color? You want it to still look like it's blue, but just darker and in shadow. It's darker, but it's also duller in, in intensity, and that's the thing that a shadow is. Because you could have a really dark color like this Prussian blue. It's almost black for, for value. But at the same time, it's a very intense color. So something in shadow is not going to have that strong of an uh, intensity like a cartoon. So that's when someone's paintings, they could be the best at drawing things and you know, get all the anatomy right and all that. But if their colors aren't right, it looks too cartoony because they're not dulling things down to look more natural. Uh, so that's really, so you really want to master uh, color mixing and be able to make natural looking colors. Of course, now we're not talking about there's lots of styles of art where it's supposed to look like that, you know, kind of more graphic design and so forth. Um, so that was with this. And yeah, in and, and places where the sun shines, you know, we use white and kind of an orangey yellow, very similar to this yellow that we have here. This is more of a true yellow, but even that's a little more on the orangey side. Some yellows start looking green. And that wouldn't be very good for snow because you're going to end up having kind of greenish looking snow for things. Um, and you also need to understand and uh, realize that mixing colors and combining different colors of paint is completely opposite. I mean, you know, <laughs> we've talked about that. Uh, and then combining different colors of light. So here we have this warm sunshine, say a white with a little orangey yellow in it. And then we have, oh, another light. It's this violety blue coming down. And mixing those two together, kind of an orangey yellow, let's say, from one light, the sun, and kind of a violety blue. So if we mix those two together with paint, what's that going to turn into? You know, yellow, let's say yellow and blue. What's that turn into? Yeah, green. Yeah. But you'll see, we, we have this on some of our videos, actually set up with a yellow light and a blue light, and you put them together, it looks more pink. It doesn't look green at all. It's an a additive process, mixing colors of light together. In paint, it's an, actually the opposite. It's a destructive process. That's why when people are not good at mixing colors, and they keep trying different things and experimenting and put a little of this in that before they, they have you know, 10 different cars to try to match something that they're looking at. And all those different cars are like, it's just a destructive process. It'll just only get worse. <laughs> so like what we have on our videos and shows, you know, really uh, uh, teaching about color theory, uh, you want to be able to make a color in as few colors as possible with this one or two steps. So you think about all the ingredients of a color, you know, the intensity, the value, and so forth, uh, and the temperature and all that. And how can I take, start out with one color, it's as close, by a tube of paint, as close as possible to what you're trying to match. Okay, it doesn't match exactly. What can I add with one or two steps and get all those ingredients to change right? I'm not gonna take five or six different paint colors and try to make this thing, because it's just gonna turn into a mess. Now with light, you have 15 different color bulbs, you put them all on, it's going to be white. It doesn't do that. So that's what you have to think. You know, I, I know I have to kind of imagine 
what is this going to look? So actually, there's kind of, you can't see it. You won't recognize it, but it's there. I have kind of pinkish colors where the sun is starting to turn into the shadow. It's, that's kind of a transition color, we call that. It's the sun, and there's a little sky put together. So instead of, that would turn green. But I had to actually make a separate mixture, kind of a pinky mauve tone. And I would use the warm color, then I would switch to my pinky tone, and then I would go into the shadow. So you always have that on almost every shadow, this transition color. And that's the same for skin tones and a hundred other things. And that's what the old masters are so good at. They know that there's transition colors. Uh, it's actually a third color going from one light temperature into another. And that's why in a portrait, someone's skin, there's all kinds of colors in a face. It's not just, I'll make a tan color and I'll make it light and dark. No, there's the greens and violets and blues and kind of grays and pinks all in one person's face because there's all these transition colors. Okay, here's, oh, I like this. This has got a good composition. So let's do something with this for our Christmas thing. And you know, there's not a lot of color in it. And I like, oh, I like this picture. It's got the lights. So like, well, in order to see lights, we have to make it nighttime. So now we're going to change this to nighttime. And what would these, this is really just the tops of trees versus pines. You don't see any snow on there. So it's this kind of a boring thing to have a background. Would it just be like a dark brown color in your painting? Uh, so I thought, well, we'll, we'll lower this so we can see more sky. And because it's, it's going to be such a cold looking thing, if you're going to do a snow scene, you want, you know, you want it to look warm. So that's the thing. The good artists out there, they do snow scenes, which is a cold thing. And they know how to make that painting where you don't mind looking at it. I mean, you have a warm feeling actually looking at it because they have some parts of the painting. Somehow they incorporated warm colors. So by lowering the horizon, not like this. Here, the horizon's way down here we can put a little sunset colors in there. So this is going to warm up this composition a little bit so it won't look so cold every time you look at it. That, and we have the lights. Uh, so I'm actually going to brighten up the snow a little farther. It'll be brighter. And I'm also thinking, you know, how is this going to be displayed? It's something you'll probably put up once a year. <laughs> you know, it's probably put up for parties or whatever. It'll probably be in a wall. And how is this going to look uh, maybe in a dark room I think it would look best in, in, when, at nighttime and you have a picture light on it, you know, with the Christmas trees and all that in, in the room, a dark setting. So that's really what I'm shooting for versus like just sitting in a kitchen and the light from the windows. That's not going to have a Christmas feel so much. Uh, so having very dark areas and then a few areas, those are going to pop out and that's that kind of effect when you look at a painting, it looks like some bright areas are glowing, you know, especially the white areas. So I do want to have keep some darker values. So that's what the sign, well, OK, I'm going to put the horizon down here. We got some warm in there. How am I going to make these hills? So I purpose, this was the first little doodle, just to see what can I do with this. I also wanted to add a little more space over here. A lot of times, this is probably from a calendar, and they chop off a picture to fit the calendar format. So there might have been more stuff over here, but I just think it would have some space. would be nice, to, and we could fit buildings in there a little better. Where would I put a building where you would hardly see it? Uh, so I moved the composition over a little bit. And I also like, oh, OK, in order for this to stand out more and get that glowing effect that we're talking about with the warm and the brightness, I'm going to make the background behind it dark. I could have just as easily had the hill come here. The sunset would be there, or maybe this lit here. We're also, the, the shadows for this will work for moonlight. So I like that. And in fact, that's one thing we really want to stress and notice that we'll see those trees over here. Even if we don't see them, we see the shadows and they're going across it. That's a nice effect. It's like, wow, I want to use that. I like that. So that, that would work. We could have a moon that's up here. So if, from now on, when I'm doing this painting, every surface that's kind of facing that way will be the brightest for snow. All right, so this would be brighter over here. And then we'll, then we'll have trees. But some people are, oh, I'll put the moon out here. I'll put the moon in the picture. I get to see the moon. That's a nice effect, isn't it? But then all the shadows that would go this way, you'd probably have a shadow behind this thing here. But you wouldn't see any of these. You know, I wouldn't have this effect of this shadows going across things. So that's why let's put the moon out there. We'll know there's a moon out there without even seeing it from the shadows, all right? Uh, what else? And so this is, so with that, See, that's the thing, too. This will work out. 
where this is dark. This is kind of the back side of a hill where the moon's more that way. So this would be more front lit. This could be another hill coming up here. So this should be brighter, this should be dark. And that way we have our dark in front of this and it will stand out a little better. Like here's the reference for that snow close up that we showed. And I just like the idea, oh, let's just, all the shapes, it's just shapes, you know, and getting the colors. And see the pink? It's pink in there. But if you didn't make that a third color, you just, well, I'll make this and I'll go into the blue. You know, you might get kind of a greenish, and it, even if you don't get the green, it, it will, just doesn't look the same as nature. So you do want to make that third uh, transition color with things. Yeah, when you're looking at the photos, you know, try to see examples in real life uh, as well as some similar situation. Because the main th problem with photos is they don't see contrast the same way our eye does. If something's kind of dark, a dark brown or green, it'll look black in the photo. You know, you just can't, no camera, I don't know why they can't invent that. They've invented so many other things. <laughs> They still haven't come up with some kind of way to capture an image the way our eye does. So if it's something bright, you know, it'll be washed out white. You can't get a, a darker rather and a brighter like a sun, a sunset. You shoot the sunset, what's the foreground? It's all black. Yeah, and people paint that. I, I did that for a little while. It has that, a nice kind of a silhouette look, but it doesn't, it looks, the problem is your, your paintings all just look like photographs, especially if you, you know, the flash, don't ever use the lighting from the flash. I mean, it just looks like a photograph, which are bad. It doesn't look like, we're, hey, we're, we're right there. Hey, Joe, we see him. There he is. Instead of psh, bright light shining on someone's face, you know, for a, a millisecond. That's not natural looking. So whenever you have to commission, say, don't give me any photographs with flashes. You know, and if you don't have one with natural light, at least the, uh, a light in the room or outside, we'll take another one because you're going to make my job way too difficult. It's not worth it, and you're not going to like the painting as much. <laughs> I don't want those problems. Yeah, I was trying to look at some, uh, too, just research to make sure I know what covered bridges look like, and I kind of do notice that they all seem to have kind of windows along the side, except for that one. But all on the top, I guess that's the kind of air out the thing or something or let light in. So I wanted to make sure I put that in there. Uh, so that was that. But has that, any of you guys painted snow before? Have you, all you guys done that? What cars did you use to make that? Do you remember? Like a, a <laughs> or did you use gray? Or did you buy a car that? Mm. Yeah, the white. You mix in, uh, like you're talking about the lavenders and the blue. That's that. So I thought, how can we make it more natural? This is some place where people go to camp out or, you know, like a vacation. So they obviously have man-made light bulbs in these teepee tents. And the camera, the guy exposed the camera or it did automatically to these lights up there in the foreground. So it made this way too bright. So I'm sure. In real life, these didn't look like a light bulb glowing. In addition to that, there were light bulbs in the, I'm sure even with the light bulbs, they weren't this bright, but that's how bright the camera made it. So it <laughs> looks like a light bulb, you know? But I made it, well, if it was a real circumstance, they didn't have electricity, it'd be a fire, so I made it much dimmer uh, and tried to put a few elements in there, wolves and uh, some skins hanging from there, drying out to make it like a natural environment. Uh, but you don't remember what colors you used to make the snow? What color does the snow have a temperature to it? I would say cold, cool. Yeah, kind of a cool color. So maybe use some blue. This was this job. But yeah, it's really fun. I don't know why. I never thought I'd like painting snow so much. But you could put all these colors and stuff that you wouldn't have normally. The, the colors from the light are seen so much. So that's where from that to this. All I care about is the composition at this point. Other than that, I just throw the picture away. I'm not even using it for anything. But it had some nice hills and stuff. I've painted this maybe four different ways. But the snow, uh, it's just, uh, you know, you have all the colors in the light uh, that you don't see if it was grass.
And originally it has some big bushes because the guy was just stuck with what's, what's out there. He can't change, cut the trees down and stuff. So there's big bushes and I'm just trying around, you know, making something that has a nice balance where it doesn't cover the background up so much so I could see what it looks like. And I don't have to mess around and try to rub it off and then you're gonna rub off some of what you painted. So yeah, this stuff comes in sheets and rolls. And, it's, and you can actually, if you use oil paints anyway, you wipe it off and you can reuse the sheet. I got sheets that I use several times. So back to this thing, the composition. I'm also thinking like uh, where your eye level is of the viewer. Do we want to make it look like this is kind of going down a hill? You know, are you above or is it going up to the to the bridge? And do you know how do you know where the person's eye level is? How high in the picture would they be? Any of you guys can guess? Anybody know that problem? That's like a little quiz. Isn't it at the top of the... Point, show me on here. Is it at the top of the bridge, oh, Where would be the... Where, where, yeah, where would be the horizon if... The, where would the sky meet the earth? Here. Okay. And why do you pick that? How do you determine that, do you think? Well, you're looking down on the roof. You're all flat. Are you? Maybe you're a little higher than I was. Because that's the thing. Uh, it's really blocked by the mountain, so it's hard to tell, right? But we have this man-made thing in the picture, and that tells us where the horizon really is. We, can, we know where it, is, where it is behind that mountain. Am I close? Yeah, oh, you are close. <laughs> and so if you want to know, like, where was the cameraman when he shot this picture, you find something like, well, when they make a structure like this, they're going to make it level. That's the important thing. If that wasn't the case, then it would be who knows where it is. But they make things and they make them level. So now, oh, we have parallel lines, lines along this rooftop that are parallel to the Earth's surface. All right? So what you do is you take a ruler or something and continue those lines. And where these two meet, that will be the horizon level in the picture. So I'm showing you, uh, so it just helps you when you're painting the rest of the picture to kind of understand what's going on. And as soon as you start changing stuff, the, the idea is not to sit there and copy photos the rest of your life. You want to use them just to help you do the ideas that you're imagining your own. You know, the photo is already done. You want to make something new. That's why you paint and not do photography. They're stuck with what's out there. Uh, but yeah, I want to add other buildings. So if I add another building, I have to see how the rooftop of the other building is going to go. So even if it's lower or higher, it's still going to be, they built that building, that house, level with the earth, just like the bridge was. So both of these, no matter which way the building is going, the roof line, when those two lines meet, you know, at a point, and when they, they'll come to a point, and there'll be like a dot, they call that the vanishing point in perspective. They should both be on the same line of, with the horizon. And here, my horizon is somewhere, you know, right in here. It can't be up here. We see the sky. Uh, so yeah, when you follow these two, somewhere off the picture, right around in here. And if you hold this thing, is this thing level? Is it going down? It kind of fooled me. I was kind of making it go up more originally, I think. And then only when I put the rule on, I go, man, that thing's pretty much almost exactly horizontal. So that tells me this is really the eye level of the guy taking the picture. So he's about, this is going uphill, and he is right here about, you know, 15 feet up in the air from this. Here would be his eye level if it was a level street. And the horizon line of the earth would actually be way down here if this wasn't going up a hill. There would be, there would be where I'm painting my sunset, that low. Because a person is about you know that tall, they, I'm just assuming they, their head would be somewhere in there in, in this bridge, and that would be the horizon. So everything from down, you know, everything from up, there'd be all this would be sky. You know, so by angling it up a little bit, now the horizon the, where they meet will be further up in the picture, and that's where you, your sky and the horizon can be. So that's how you, you decide that or change it. It's like I don't want so much sky in my picture, maybe. If you change this, it will really look like you're getting a bird's eye view. You're up in a tree looking at the scene, which can be kind of neat. Or you're really, that's a really uh, steep hill going up this. This is a really hilly area, which is nice.